Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to you all to today's European Commission representation in Ireland's webinar called Ireland and the New European Bauhaus. My name is Noelle O'Connell and I'm the CEO of European Movement Ireland and I'm delighted to be chairing today's really timely and informative webinar. I'm personally very much looking forward to learn a little bit more about this new European Bauhaus, which is an EU initiative aiming to bring citizens, experts, businesses, communities, institutions together to facilitate conversations about making tomorrow's living spaces more affordable and accessible. And if anything, in terms of as we navigate our way to recovery post the COVID pandemic, I think this is a really important initiative and very much looking forward to our expert panel of speakers talking us through the different aspects of what is involved in the new European Bauhaus. So we have a great lineup of speakers uh, for this morning's event. Um, and I'm delighted that, uh, as, as is appropriate for an event such as this, uh, a great geographical uh, dispersion as well. In terms of setting the scene, we are delighted to, first of all, open the event will be Orla Murphy of UCD. Um, Orla is joining us from lovely Westport. And so we're not at all envious of you there, Orla, in, in beautiful Westport. And then followed uh, by Orla, delighted to be joined from Strasbourg by Green Party MEP for Dublin, Kieran Cuff, who will set the scene um, and give us the EU and the institutional context. And then finally, delighted to be joined in Dublin by Sean McCabe, the executive Executive Manager of Task Climate Justice Centre. So, uh, Kieran, Orla, Sean, a very good morning to you all and thank you for being with us today. And in terms of housekeeping, ladies and gentlemen, we'd be delighted if you would continue to submit your questions. We've a we've a, a full house, virtually full house for this morning's event. We've already got some fantastic questions in. So please do continue to submit your questions to events at europeanmovement.ie. For those of you active on social media, do feel free to tweet and engage in the conversation using hashtag new European Bauhaus. And please use the handles at EU or, or EU or Ireland and EM Ireland. So thank you very much for that. So to help us understand and to set the scene and open proceedings today um, in terms of this new European Bauhaus, what's involved? I'm delighted I will to be turning first to Orla Murphy, who is assistant professor in UCD's School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy, where she jointly coordinates the Mar Masters of Architecture Design. And she is also the co-director of the UCD Center for Irish Towns and owner of Custom Architecture. She is an ambassador for the new European Bauhaus and is a member of the NEB High Level Roundtable. So she's expertly equipped to talk us through what's involved in the new European Bauhaus. Orla, a very good morning to you and I'm delighted to pass over the virtual floor to you. Good morning, Noel, and good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, the kind invitation to organize this event today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to begin by kind of describing what the new European Bauhaus is for anybody who's not familiar with it. I know some of, uh, some of you in the audience today may know quite a bit about it already, but just to bring everybody along, I'm gonna describe how it came about and how it's working, um, its relevance for Ireland um, and in the context of moving to a decarbonized society. So I suppose to, to, to give a little bit of background, when the EC president, Ursula von der Leyen, made her State of the Union address last September, um, she was speaking about the European Green Deal. And it caught my eye because it was the first time that I'd ever heard a high level political leader mention the importance of design. And she said that um, this is our opportunity to make change happen by design and not by disaster or by diktat. Um, and I suppose that speaks to um, some of the, the conversations around climate crisis can tend to be either reactionary in terms of reacting to disaster or regulatory in terms of you have to do this. So this was a different type of, of narrative space that she was creating. And she went on to announce plans to set up the new European Bauhaus as a co-creation space where architects, artists, students, engineers, designers work together to make that happen. So the new European Bauhaus is a European uh, Commission initiative and it's centred around three guiding principles and they are sustainability, beauty and inclusion. 
And the project has three phases, uh, the co-design phase, which began last January, and that's going to run until the end of this month, so the end of June. The delivery phase, which will kind of run in parallel with the co-design phase, but really uh, kicking off from June onwards. And that's going to create a support framework with at least five new uh, substantial new European Bauhaus pilot projects across the EU. And then the dissemination phase, which is going to spread, continue to spread and grow the initiative, um, take learning from the pilot projects and disseminate them and aim to build the, the movement and the momentum around it. So firstly, I suppose the co-design phase, so what is that? It aims to kind of clarify what the new European Bauhaus concept is from the bottom up, um, which is quite unusual, I think, for a, a political organization, uh, especially the scale of the EU, to try to do something like this. So it's by um, using co-design to effectively try to reach out to every citizen in Europe and to ask for their input in the form of ideas or examples or challenges or studies. And all of these contributions are going to be take, taken into account to shape the project um, using what's called uh, a sense maker tool. Um, so I suppose I'd say to anybody in the audience today, if you or any group that you know or any community you're involved with would like to be part of this co-design process, please, the invitation is there to do so, uh, to contribute what your thoughts, ideas, what do you think the challenges are in relation to the climate crisis and how design can respond to those? So the way to do that is to visit the website um, for the new European Bauhaus and to upload your submission. It's quite a straightforward process. Um, and you can also see previous submissions made and you can see emerging patterns. Um, another way for organizations and associations to engage with the project is to apply to become official partners. Um, and it's great to see that the Irish Architecture Foundation has recently been announced as the first Irish partner. So hopefully uh, more announcements uh, about Irish partners will follow. And then the, the next stage is the delivery phase. So using input from the first co-design phase, the aim is to uh, shape a call for the first five new European Bauhaus pilot projects. And the plan is to support and deliver those pilots in the short term while ensuring that the movement uh, that that's triggered will continue to deliver broader change in the ground in a lasting way. Um, so my role as part of the new European Bauhaus is um, as part of the high level round table. So I was selected as one of 18 members of the High Level Roundtable and uh, we're all jointly also ambassadors for the new European Bauhaus. And I suppose just it is important to say that, that the High Level Roundtable isn't a formal expert advisory group for the Commission um, and we're, we don't decide on any funding linked to the project, we're voluntary. So the idea is our role is to feed into the co-design phase of the initiative with my colleagues uh, who all have different uh, experiences and perspectives uh, and are from different regional parts of, of the EU and beyond. And we inspire the project with our knowledge and experience from our work. Um, and I suppose we're, we're, we're trying to explore ways of living together, as Noel mentioned, considering key developments across various areas. So including creativity, technology, urbanism, social dimensions. Um, and these come from uh, different experiences uh, from the, the members of the High Level Roundtable. So we give ideas and we enlarge the horizon for the work and act as ambassadors for the initiative and a bridge between our communities and the new European Bauhaus team in the JRC. So we can also take feedback back from our communities and bring it back to the uh, the main group in Brussels. And I suppose um, we there's a slight uh, hope as well that we would be kind of critical disruptors so that we remain objective and have a kind of a critical gaze on the, uh, the, the new European Bauhaus as it emerged in a most positive way possible. So you might ask, why do we need a new European Bauhaus? Well, um, I think as Naomi Klein points out in her book, this changes everything. Addressing the climate crisis is going to require destructive systemic and behavioural change. And at the moment, we are living through an unfolding disruptive event, the global pandemic, which I think in some ways has put some of the challenges related to the climate crisis into sharper relief, but also maybe demonstrates how in the way that in which we've responded to the pandemic can give us some confidence and a direction about how we need to go about decarbonisation. Over the last 18 months as a society, I think we've coalesced in order to protect the most vulnerable and to safeguard, safeguard our healthcare system. So care, if you like, at the scale of the individual and at the scale of the system. And we've made enormous sacrifices, you know, in who we could see, in who we socialised with, how we learned and how we taught, how we moved around. Existing inequalities 
especially around housing, education, access to technology and access to public space have been very clearly laid bare. However, I think social cohesion has generally held and in some cases, many cases indeed, has flourished as communities of people came together to look after one another, to nurture and care for nature in innovative ways and to support local businesses. And this more bottom up change has continued to kind of gain momentum because the benefits are very tangible. We can see them in the desire for better public space, better housing, more flexible modes of working and learning, for example. And so I think this pandemic can perhaps teach us how we need to act in the face of climate crisis and global heating. To realize the European Commission's ambitious target to reduce CO2 emissions by 55% by 2030 and to decarbonize Europe fully by 2050, we'll need to embrace the changes required together as neighbors. Maintaining global heating close to 1.5 degrees Celsius and decarbonization requires fundamental social, behavioral and cultural change by everyone in how we live our lives, in how we move, in what we make, repair, buy and eat, in how we care for one another. And thus far, progress has been far too slow. And I think it's been too remote from most citizens who don't feel that their actions matter or that their voices are heard. So social cohesion in the face of such a massive change is going to be key. And social justice, supporting those whose lives and livelihoods are likely to be most affected by the transition will be vital. And this is why change needs to be co-created by everyone so that each citizen of Europe is part of the solution. Their actions aggregated to the scale of the continent can be transformative. Actions from the bottom are going to need substantial innovative support from the top, and which is why we need the European Bauhaus, in my opinion. So by way of example, if you look at Ireland, we have increasing car dependency, which has uh, increased over the last 50 years, and that's caused a chain of connected impacts. Poorly planned peripheral low density settlement patterns have led to pre persistent city and town centre vacancy, underperforming infrastructure networks and degraded public space. There are over 200,000 empty houses in Ireland and over a million homes that require energy upgrade. Air pollution, traffic congestion, long commutes to work and school and high levels of obesity and associated health problems ensue, along with isolation of the elderly and vulnerable due to a lack of public transport and all with high carbon dependency on individual fossil fuel transport. So while these problems have evolved and deepened over time, it seemed we've been half blind to the impact of this change. But how might the new European Bauhaus affect change in Ireland? Well, it is exciting because it describes a co-created, people-led and design-informed approach. And it's clear we need to listen to the stories and experience of people to affect positive societal and behavioural change by design. And the acknowledgement that good design can and must improve the lives of everyone in such a way that makes intelligent, effective use of existing resources. Adaptive reuse and energy upgrade of existing buildings, reprioritizing public spaces for people before cars, improving biodiversity and access to nature and urban areas to make cities and towns healthy, resilient and great places to live, work and play in an inclusively designed way would be key. Land use policy needs to take into account a just transition so that those who work to produce food and to steward the land are involved in the conversation. We need to become a radically inclusive society and to shift from an economy of endless growth to a circular economy of belonging. So what can the new European Bauhaus do? Well, it has the scope, as far as I can see, to scale up and scale out a cultural shift that can transform society by society to become a decarbonized, healthy, resilient, diverse and inclusive Europe. The potential to mobilize and aspire with ambition at the scale of a continent is very exciting. So you could imagine livable and walkable towns and cities designed and renovated to become net positive energy places while embracing their cultural distinctiveness. Imagine a Europe that supports, care for, cares for and listens to those less frequently heard, one that renovates existing buildings to make homes, schools, places of culture that are carbon neutral, beautiful and distinctive, one that builds resilience to extreme weather events using nature-based solutions, one that attracts people of all ages to live good quality, socially connected lives. Everybody can play their part in the new European Bauhaus initiative, so I'd encourage you to contribute to the project, to share ideas and actions that contribute to the ambition to make the Europe that we want to live in beautiful, sustainable and inclusive. Thank you, Noel. Noel, I think you're you might Noelle.
Oh, sorry, folks. Technical glitches on the user 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 failure there. Nothing to do with the uh, the Bauhaus. My own fault. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I was there complimenting Orla for her excellent speech, and I think I was the only one that heard my <laughs> my compliments to you, Orla. I was very sorry about that. Thank you very much, um, Orla, for for that. I I was just uh, I was saying to myself, and now I'm going to uh, pay you the compliment in person to our audience. Um, I loved you. your critical disruptor comments. I thought. Uh, that's fantastic and a really great overview um, of the new European Bauhaus and really setting the scene. So thank you very much, Orla. Um, now delighted to be joined from Westport to Strasbourg we go. And our next speaker on today's panel is Kieran Kuff, who was elected an MEP to the European Parliament for the Green Party for Dublin in 2019. And Kieran sits on the Energy and Transport Committees of the European Parliament, and he also serves as president of EUFORES, a European NGO that promotes the deployment of renewable energy sources and energy efficiency. Uh, Kieran is an architect and a planner, and he graduated in 2019 with a master's in cities from London School of Economics. He has also previously served as a Dublin City Councillor, a TD for Dunleary, and Minister of State with Responsibility for Sustainable Transport and Climate Change. So he is extremely well versed and well qualified to give us his thoughts uh, today on the new European Bauhaus. Kieran, really appreciate you joining us from Strasbourg. I know how busy you are, so delighted to invite you to take the virtual floor. Thank you. Thanks, Noel, and it's really good to be with you. I, I think um, Le Corbusier would have approved of my rather Spartan background here in Strasbourg with a, a thermostat over my, uh, uh, over my right shoulder and a simple glazed window on the, on the other side. Um, listen, Orla's uh, preparatory remarks, are, uh, remarks were, I think, gave huge insight into what the new European uh, Bauhaus might be, and I, I know I'm at uh, risk of repeating a lot of what uh, she said, but what I might do is just give a little bit of background and talk maybe about what I think distinguishes the first iteration of the Bauhaus in the 1930s and uh, uh, 40s uh, from, from the, uh, the new European Bauhaus now. And I guess in a sense, the original Bauhaus was about this white heat of technology that would save us all. It was about no limits. It was about bigger, taller, faster. Uh, the building, uh, the home as a machine for living in as. Uh, and it did perhaps have a big focus on architects as the, the kind of the superheroes who would uh, save us all, even though there was uh, actually quite a bit of uh, emphasis on uh, craftsmanship and, and indeed on the arts in the original Bauhaus. But I guess the new European Bauhaus, rather than saying there's no limits, it's saying, look, we have to live within a world where there are limits and, and those limits have been set by nature. First and foremost, um, to try and ensure that the uh, temperature of the planet doesn't rise too much but also protecting biodiversity as well. And that forces us, forces us into new ways of thinking uh, if we have to work within limits. Uh, we have to work with others. Uh, we have to collaborate. There has to be quite a focus on interdisciplinary working. Uh, and this is quite a shift. I think it is a new paradigm. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the Bauhaus is quite close to my heart. My, my, my late father studied under Walter Gropius uh, at the original Bauhaus when it moved to the US. Uh, and I remember the conversations about this, this um, extraordinary um, enthusiasm for things that are new, that are machine produced, uh, that um, are different from anything that went before. But I think within the new European Bauhaus, we perhaps put much more recognition and value on the past, on our heritage, on what we already have. And I think that was exemplified this year uh, by the winners of the, the Pritzker Prize, the annual, uh, the annual architecture prize, and the French winners, the couple Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal. And they won the Pritzker Prize for architecture 
mainly on the basis of the work that they have done to existing buildings. And in fact, they've said it straight up that the most sustainable building is the one we already have. And this, in some ways, turns an, an awful lot of what I learned in architecture school 30 years ago on its head. Uh, uh, but I think we do have to focus on the existing built environment and we have to rethink it, regenerate it, renovate it. That re-prefix comes into so much of what we're thinking about. And actually, you know, going back a few years when I was teaching at uh, TU Dublin, DIT in Bolton Street, I set up a master's program in urban regeneration because I think the existing city, uh, existing urban areas, whether it be towns or cities, they have so much value. They are, they are in a sense what we, what we inherited from our forebears and improving and making better use of what we already have, I think will be a hallmark of the new European Bauhaus. And one of the files I've been dealing with uh, here in the European Parliament has been what we call the renovation wave. And this is very simply a realization that 40% of the greenhouse, or 40% uh, of the energy use in building in, in Europe comes from the buildings that we spend our times, times in. 36% of the greenhouse gas emissions comes from those buildings. And what we want to try and do is get all of the building stock up to what you might call an A energy rating uh, by 2050. So we have this hugely important uh, role as custodians of the existing built environment of bringing those buildings up to a higher uh, uh, level of performance over the next 30 years. And it's not just simply about ripping out a boiler and putting in a heat pump. I think it is about a holistic approach that thinks about the design, the use, the heating, the cooling, the appearance, and yes, that somewhat challenging word, word of beauty. And I think we can do this, and I think it will realize a huge amount of new jobs. It will require a lot of retraining, but I think if we do it right, it will produce an economy that's fit for purpose uh, and an environment which we will be proud to spend our time in. And intuitively, we know what that's like. We know when we uh, travel abroad or even when we travel within our own hometown, there are streets, there are places, there are squares that quite simply work. They're often a mixture of uses, the upper floors, evening, they are vibrant places where uh, people who are young or people who are old feel safe, feel protected, uh, and we need to do more to make that so. So that is kind of a little bit of an overview. And I see it as being more than looking at the building. It's about looking at the wider neighborhood, but it's also about looking at the small, beautiful objects that characterize the first new European Bauhaus of a, a, a chair. But now if we design a chair, we might think about, well, what materials did we use in making that chair? Were they produced sustainably? And what happens when we throw it out? Will it be recycled? So it is this, um, some say a, a cradle to grave approach or as uh, Braungart and McDonough say, a cradle to cradle approach that uh, what was disposed of will become the, the product or uh, the raw materials for the next generation. So the circular economy comes into play. Finally, moving on to the politics of all of this. Within the European Parliament, in a few weeks time on the 14th of July, Bastille Day, we will have a package of new draft laws called the Fit for 55 package. And the intention is that this will help us reduce our emissions by 55% from by, by, by the year 2030, starting from 1990. So it's not quite as steep a trajectory as we're hoping to achieve in Ireland in a decade. It nonetheless is hugely challenging to everyone. And this is at the heart of the transformation that we have to make. If you go back to the early years of the European Union, when it was the European Economic Community, and even before that, in the 1950s, it was the coal and steel community. Coal and steel. We almost wince when we mention those words uh, in, in the context of sustainability, because we're trying to move away from coal. 
and not just towards gas, but towards electricity from renewable sources. And we're trying to reuse the steel that we have rather than um, mine more uh, metal ore from the earth. So this kind of complete transformation of our view of the world will make its way into legislation that we'll see um, coming down the pike within the next, uh, within the next uh, month. And it will be challenging and it will certainly put huge pressure on existing jobs, existing industries to completely retool and recreate themselves to be fit for purpose for the years ahead. I don't doubt the extent and the magnitude of that challenge. Uh, and I think what Ursula von der Leyen was saying to us with the new European Bauhaus is we cannot simply talk in terms of the numbers. We have to use creativity, we have to use design, and we have to work together to achieve that. And it, it's not just about the interdisciplinary working in Ireland of maybe bringing the engineers, the architects, and the craftsperson into the same room to talk about what we want to achieve. It's about reaching out to Central Europe, to economies that are hugely dependent on coal, hugely dependent on heavy industry and helping them make those changes. And I think if you look at the big killers in Europe and, um, you know, uh, sedentary occupations and obesity, poor air quality, car accidents, a lot of what Orla referenced there of moving away from high levels of car dependence and looking at our pandemic recovery, the pandemic really hit uh, impacted on communities in northern Italy where there's a lot of industry and a lot of air pollution. So if we can clean up our industry, if we can make it easier for children or older people to get around by walking or cycling, if we can create these new opportunities, that to me will be the manifestation of the new European Bauhaus. It'll be communities and neighborhoods where we feel safe and comfortable. It'll be about new jobs that don't result in lots of waste. Uh, has the potential to be an extraordinarily positive force in not just helping out those who have the means to make this change rapidly, but in achieving a just transition that brings the poorest of the poor with us. And we know what happens if we do it wrong. We've seen the gilet jaune, the yellow vests in France. You can't simply bring in a law and say we have to achieve this. You have to bring everyone with you. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Fantastic, Kieran. Thank you so much for those comments. And um, I, I, I really think I loved the cradle to cradle uh, concept. I think that's, that's fantastic. And just in terms of bringing actually that EU and that institutional perspective it will be really, really important about realizing some of the, the, the lofty ambitions that you have outlined. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, before we move on to the last member of our panel today, uh, Sean McCabe, and I think Sean has some slides slides for us, so I leave him try to get his slides up and running. Um, great to see the level of questions, ladies and gentlemen, that are coming in from you, our audience here today. Um, lots of uh, topical questions for our speakers, so please do feel free if anybody else has any questions or comments to email them into events at europeanmovement.ie and on social media, please feel free to use the hashtag new European uh, Bauhaus. So to close off uh, today's speakers, before we turn to our panel, I'm delighted uh, that we are going to be joined by Sean McCabe. Sean is the executive manager of Task Climate Justice Center and his work there focuses on developing evidence-based people-centered and community-led climate actions and strategies strategies and he's currently managing two community projects uh, the people's transition in Fibsborough in Dublin and Ardara Donegal and he is also part of the global secretariat for the children's environmental rights initiative um, under the auspices of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights. Um, and he also serves as a climate justice officer at Bohemian Football Club. And prior to joining TASC, he worked as a policy officer with the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice for over five years. Sean, delighted uh, that you're with us today. And uh, I'd now like you to deliver your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Noel. Um, I can't see anyone, but I hope you can hear me. Um, Perfect. We're all good. Thank you, Kieran and Orla, as well, for your uh, interventions. It's been fascinating so far. I've quite a bit here, so I'm going to move quite quickly. I have my timer on, so hopefully I'll stick to my 10 minutes. I'm going to try to cover the people's transition, what it is and where it came from. I want to talk a little bit about community wealth building and climate action uh, in rural communities and then touch on community-led local development. And as Orla mentioned, uh, I, I like the tagline for the new uh, European uh, Bauhaus being beautiful, sustainable and together. And really, this is about together. How do we design participation? Uh, so what is the people's transition? Well, people's transition is um, a model that uh, was the culmination of two years research that I did with in conjunction with FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, and TASC, the think tank uh, for action on social change that I work for in Dublin. Um, it proposes a participative model of decision making that views climate action as an enabler of local development, gives communities the ownership of the transition, to zero carbon societies and enhances public support by rising standards of living and tackling inequality. And I think this is very important. Um, we need to proactively tackle inequality. I think, you know, I, I, I totally accept Orla's points earlier about the, the incredible community spirit that emerged during the pandemic, but we also have to look, I think, clear-eyed at some of the challenges that the pandemic illustrated, like the spatial justice issues that arose when people were confined to two kilometers, or you know, the rise of the far right, which definitely mobilized around the restrictions that were in place and kind of using them as, as a galvanizing tool. We've got issues with unemployment that I don't think have been fully realized yet. And, and one in four people cut back on their food or their utilities because of financial pressures due to the pandemic. So when we talk about a disruption in society and the pandemic is relatively small compared to what the climate could be, we, are, we need to do quite a lot to get this right. The, 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 the people's transition is based on three core assumptions. The first is that climate action has to happen, uh, transformative climate action has to happen in the absence of widespread public support. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, to be successful, climate action has to enhance standards of living, as I just mentioned. And, and finally, and this is very important, local development will always be more important to people than climate action on the timescales that we're talking about in terms of implementing the changes we have to make. So in terms of the, the transformative nature of climate action, as Orla said, it is very systematic, it is very deep rooted, and it has to happen ridiculously quickly. So we know the timeline of 2030, um, it, it depends on how you consider capabilities of countries and historical responsibility globally, just when we have to reach zero, but it's very, very soon. Um, some would calculate it as soon as the middle of this decade, if we were to abide by equity across the planet. Um, and in terms of public support, it's quite challenging. You know, you cannot spend our, we cannot spend our time painting a very bleak picture for farmers, for example, uh, and then not expect a smooth transition when that change happens. Kieran also mentioned Le Gilets Jaunes and the response to a, a, a fuel tax, a diesel tax. Now, that was the straw that bro broke the camel's back, if you will. There were other regressive um, policies in place, but it was seen as regressive, it was seen as harmful, and it led to revolt. We don't have time for revolt. We don't have time for um, a, a lack of social cohesion at this point. Also, in order to be successful, climate action must enhance standards of living. We have seen over the past two decades how neoliberalism, neoliberalism has really widened that gap between the haves and the have-nots. And one of the big challenges that we face in terms of climate action is we've seen a withdrawal of state provision over the last two decades, three decades, and a rollout of market-based approaches. Um, the problem with market-based approaches is they promote individualism, so kind of this idea that we can somehow consume our way out of a crisis brought about by excess consumption, uh, and also competition, and, and it seems unfair that communities should have to compete for scarce resources in order to tackle the climate crisis um, when there is so much at stake. So this is about how do we proactively build social approval in the design of climate action and how we go about it. The final piece is that we must align objectives of communities with our objectives of climate action and not the other way around. We, we have to make sure that people are seeing their needs and their priorities met through climate action rather than expect them to change their behaviours um, because of um, a relatively small amount of people causing this crisis. So participation uh, is part of a broader collaboration in uh, 
the process of climate action between communities and those with power. It starts with participation. It starts with engaging the community. But Orla also spoke about the, the need for co-creation. Co-creation has to value local knowledge. It has to understand that communities have needs and priorities that matter to them, that they're very real. And, and, and operating at that local level gives us the ability to design local solutions rather than coming in with high-level, top-down solutions. Um, once we can build trust in decision-making, we can enhance the demand for greater climate action. If communities start to see that the co-creation and co-ownership of climate action actually leads to better outcomes for their communities, they'll want more. This requires building a culture of trust, um, and, and trust is at the bottom of the people's transition model. So this is the model. I feel a little bit of shame putting this up in front of a, a, a lot of architects. It could probably be better designed visually, but, but it has a community stream, a political stream, and a communication stream all designed to bring about climate policy and climate actions that are, um, you know, enhance social approval, are, are welcomed by communities, and, and communities actually benefit through co-ownership. Um, if we talk quickly about what the community-led led climate action might look like, we could talk about community wealth building. And I'll just speed through this because some of you may have heard of this already, but it's really the plural ownership of the economy, putting assets into the hands of the community through what we call anchor institutions, community wealth builders, stable institutions with real purchasing power that can be influenced through ideas like progressive procurement. So this is where we look at not just uh, best value for money, but are we actually having a tangible impact in communities? Are we creating good jobs? Are we providing um, for a, a local economy rather than a global economy? Um, there's all sorts of opportunities for uh, community wealth building throughout the supply chain, but if we if we really think about it, this these won't be availed of true business as usual. We have to intentionally design an economy that's distributive through the transformation. Uh, into uh, a climate safe future. So how we go about that redesign of our supply chains will be key to that distributive economy. So it looks a little bit like this, I can come back to it, but it's workers cooperatives that are supported by municipal governments and non-profit corporations that, that, that feed in uh, finances into those sort of cooperatives. And then those cooperative supplying institutions um, that are government owned with the goods and services they need. Um, it's been tried in Preston, it works. It's also been tried in uh, a number of other places in the UK, all, uh, all Labour government initiatives. And in the last uh, election, uh, in the local government elections last month, um, those places with <laughs> community wealth building were the places where the Labour Party didn't lose seats, which is interesting. And then the question of protectionism is, it comes up when we talk about this. I'll, I'll just skip this for now, but just to say it's not really protectionism at all. It's about fair employment and a, a just labour market. So in rural communities, how would it work? This is the key point, is that we don't have uh, necessarily a lot of universities or hospitals in rural communities, but we will have to do a lot of climate action in rural communities. And so how we think about that climate action, is it uh, going to be installed by large multinational corporations who have no sense of place or belonging to the area? Or is it going to be owned by the community through cooperatives or community businesses that actually put assets in the hands of the community and let that community build its own future? We can intentionally locate, localize, and let communities own elements of the supply chain of climate action. Uh, but this won't happen without intentional efforts to distribute that supply chain. Um, it's worked in Kentucky. I'm speeding here because I'm coming up on my 10 minutes. Um, but the Mountain Association in Kentucky brought together stakeholders to address energy poverty and have subsequently developed six rural electric cooperatives, um, which are all contributing to better social, economic and environmental outcomes in rural Kentucky. This is a key point. I just, I'm, I'm just at time, but I'd like to um, address this really quickly because I'd love to see how the new European uh, Bauhaus links in with existing processes uh, and specifically with the leader or the community-led local development process. Uh, Orla mentioned earlier about the intelligent use of existing resources. This is a huge resource that could play a key role in the future. Now, there's a lot to be fixed. There's a lot of kinks in the, in, 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 in the model as it currently is implemented in Ireland, but it has been shown to work. Leader, um, evaluations have repeatedly shown that the money invested through communities stays in communities and lifts standards of living. Now, 
there's uh, an element of leader, um, well, or the evolution of leader in the EU is called community, the community-led local development multi-fund approach. Typically, leader has been funded through an individual fund, the agricultural fund. Um, but in 2016, uh, or in 2014, shall I say, uh, the EU opened up um, leader to multiple funds so it could be the social fund or it could be the just transition fund as we're soon to see uh, come into being so the question is do we want to parcel off uh, pieces of each of those funds to fund bottom-up community-led approaches that could lead to this type of transformative climate action and um, there's numerous benefits broader scope of projects than currently funded under leader uh, better adapted to specific territorial features wider participation, wider variety of partners, and then that idea of avoiding de demarcation. We have we've a real knack of having, uh, you know, communities understand how everything interacts, and by the time we get it to a national or particularly multilateral decision-making forum, everything's siloed, and um, this avoids that demarcation. So just to find, just to come to a conclusion, uh, we need to arrive to, at a point where climate action is fundamentally participatory participative by design. And that's why this uh, new EU uh, Bauhaus really is exciting to me because of that focus on togetherness. Um, but it's not just the design of policy uh, and it cannot just be in planning. It has to be an implementation and the ownership of solutions. And that piece is key. The assets, who controls them, who owns them. And um, that is real participation. So genuinely participative climate action is place-based, it's co-designed, it's co-created and it's co-owned. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Sean. Thank you so much for those those uh, comments and a great way to round up um, our three fantastic presentations from our three speakers. So thank you very much for that. I too will be racing through the Q&A because they're coming in hot and heavy, folks. So I hope you're all ready. I'll, I'll just go through all the questions and I might just ask you then to jump in at what's uh, at what you'd all individually like to pick up on. So I think this might be one uh, for Orla Kieron as architects. Um, how do you see modular homes making a difference into um, into the ends, no, maybe, sorry, into the new house, uh, the new European Bauhaus, with the ability to design from the start of the project, and and then, so Orla, do you want to take that one, maybe, because there's some political ones, Kieran, that I might throw at you. <laughs> um, thanks, Noel. I, yeah, I suppose it, it, going into the discussion of housing and housing procurement and housing models, um, we we could expand this conversation to last a very long time but i suppose what what is going to be necessary is that we um firstly i suppose in terms of materials um we really need to use the materials that we have more effectively we need to move from um steel reinforced concrete that means we've got to use different types of materials and different types of construction techniques so moving to renewables um I don't think it's going to be just timber, actually. I think there's a big opening question about management of you know, how we even move to a completely timber-based construction uh, ecosystem. I think we're going to have to move to a much more blended um, e construction ecosystem that makes much more use, for example, of de demolition waste, which is something that, that is barely um, on the horizon as yet. Um, but it ties into, Sean showed the uh, donut economic model, which is all about um, uh, circular economy. Uh, this is veering a little bit from housing, but housing is very much part of, um, be because there's a huge need to house a growing population, not just in Ireland, but in Europe in general and in the world. Um, how we build this new housing, how we reuse existing buildings much more intelligently um, in the first case, and how we design new housing in a way that's going to last, in a way that might be demountable, in, may, in a way that use, uh, thinks about demolition waste, uh, that uses a, a different palette of materials, including biomaterials, materials that we can uh, reassemble and take apart. And modular um, housing will be part of that palette, I see. I don't think it's a, a single shot solution in itself. Um, modularity, I suppose, has advantages in terms of a different type of construction technique, which is moving away from wet construction techniques. So it's part of that uh, solution, but it will be, uh, I suppose, one component in a, a much bigger picture. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Orla. Kieran, this one I might I might put to you if that's okay. And it's from uh, Doris Alexander, Associate Director of European Engagement at Trinity College Dublin. And she's wondering, in terms of the three phases, is there still opportunity to transform even whilst in the dissemination phase? For example, I have seen mention of the Bauhaus in the draft documentation for Horizon Europe missions. So do we view the phases of the Bauhaus as each being time limited or a living process which will continually transform in line with the implementation of the Green Deal and continual design and co-creation? Well, I, I suspect Orla may well be better placed to answer that one on the detail, but I'd imagine uh, that there will be changes as we go through the different phases of the Bauhaus. And I certainly think uh, we, we talked a lot about co-creation and collaboration. There would have to be strong links to the research that's undertaken under the, under the Horizon programme. And I, I think that should be uh, a, a real win-win. And um, so I think that is, uh, that is possible. And I think given that we have so many new laws coming down that we haven't seen yet that we will see in about a month's time uh, i think there will be the opportunity to to change direction somewhat to incorporate a, a lot of uh, what horizon might produce and other other initiatives the great thing about the website the european commission has put out is that there are good examples that give you a good feel for what is possible and i was just looking there there's modular construction there's the reuse of existing buildings. So a lot of the things that uh, all three of us have talked about do feature as actual built examples that might uh, stimulate both research and actual maybe, you know, pre pre um, construction projects. Great. Thank you, Kieran. Sorry, Orla, did you want to come in on that point? Just to, to add, um, I suppose that the first co-design stage, it does end at the end of June. So please make a submission to that. Uh, that's important. And your submission might be even that the co-design process has got to continue to fold in Horizon Europe and those further stages of learning and dissemination. Um, so they will all be used to shape the next stages, but they're not going to be fixed stages as, as I understand it. Um, but I suppose that the, the JRC are being quite careful at the moment to try to not predict what the next stage is until they get in everything and analyse it in order to see what the next stage is. So it's very much a living, growing, policy connected and research connected and people connected initiative. Um, so yes, but yes, in general, I would think uh, it won't be, the door won't be shut at the end of June. Okay. That's, that's good to know. So thank you both very much for that. Um, Sean, I might go to you on this question. And uh, I think it's come in on, on social media at hashtag New European Bauhaus. Um, and this questioner is wondering that, do you have any thoughts on how to scale up consumer behavior? Um, I think we need to maybe move the conversation a little bit away from the consumer um, and to the producers and, and and particularly the intermediaries and um, if we look at uh, farming as, a, as a, an example um, and the pressures that farmers are under and, and you know the, the intensification of farming that we see um, as one example and this leads to um, you know um, pretty challenging conversations about emissions and um, uh, really what's happening there is a system is failing both sides of the equation. You have got consumers who are oftentimes working um, minimum wage jobs or maybe more than one job and can only afford to shop in these large multiple stores that um, really put farmers under pressure to deliver at prices that are not sustainable. So it's both sides of that equation is it has, there's a massive issue. If you had, if you had the consumer on a living wage, if you had the consumer having real viable cooperative stores available to them within their community that pr provide locally sourced vegetables, say here in Dublin, rather than vegetables sourced from the south of Spain where slave labor is involved in the production of, 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 of the vegetables, we, we would have a very different scenario on our hands. So um, sometimes we uh, get caught up, and this comes back to my point on individualism in, in, in the transition. Um, if we get focused in on what the consumer can do, firstly, it's incredibly frustrating for people who have 
uh, as Rose Wall from Community Law and Mediation says, there's a lot of people more concerned about the end of the week than the end of the world. So if you're putting the pressure on those people to fuel the transition, that is completely unjust. Um, you have to deal with the system that they're working within. So that's where living wages, four-day work weeks, things that give people the luxury to consume uh, appropriately uh, are very necessary. And then the regulation on the, the big actors who really are making off like bandits and all of this by putting pressure on the consumer and the producer and taking all the profits for themselves. So um, these are the these are the kind of and this is where you know I I had the good fortune of coming into um, Orla's um, Masters of Architecture module last year to talk about climate justice and really I think architects are uniquely positioned to think about the systems design failures that are happening and really employ a design thinking approach to solve some of these um, and and. Uh, so that's what I talk about. Scale, scale might actually be about localizing rather than finding big, big scale solutions that can be applied everywhere. Let local communities design their own solutions. I think that's a great slogan and a great motto there, Sean. Thank you very much for that. Um, our next question comes from Nicola Tomic, um, our good friends at the Design and Crafts Council of Ireland. And uh, they're wondering that why uh, isn't there more government support for the new European Bauhaus in Ireland? Could there be a national campaign advertising it and perhaps asking people to participate in the co-design phase? Uh, you know, with the slogan, everyone can contribute, but not a lot of people know about it. Um, with the challenge of advocates on the ground can only do so much. What would the, Kieran? maybe will I, will I turn to you on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is an issue we had at a political level that there isn't a budget line uh, designated for the new European Bauhaus. And within the parliament, we debated and argued that there should be, but we haven't been successful. I think it probably falls between a, a few different departments. Dara O'Brien's area, my own colleague, uh, Catherine Martin. Uh, and I think there could be a role uh, for my colleagues in government to maybe push the boat out a bit on this and uh, get the word out that the new European Bauhaus is there because we're all aware of it, but we certainly often live within a particular circle where we, we hear messages that maybe um, everyone else isn't hearing. And I think we certainly should be promoting it uh, within our third level institutions uh, to make students aware of the possibilities as we move uh, towards the next phase. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Um, the next question is uh, from Justin Byrne, the Chief Operating Officer of the Irish Environmental Network. And I think it was something, Kieran, that you touched upon in your remarks, but uh, Justin would like to hear about how the circular economy will be integrated into the new European Bauhaus. Is that something Orla or Kieran would like to take? I, I might come in just very briefly. We have a circular economy strategy at a European Union level. It is being revisited to tighten it up. Uh, and that phrase I used earlier, cradle to cradle, of ensuring that we have less waste and more reusable components, whether that be a, a bottle that can be brought back for a deposit or whether it be in other areas of activity. So it will come into the laws that we'll be working on in the parliament. Uh, over over the months ahead, and I think there's huge potential there. I'm always amazed if I put up, you know, excess packaging as a picture on social media, everybody jumps in and says, do something about this. It's a wonderfully tangible example of the throwaway culture that we are all victims of and we want to see action on. And I think across the political spectrum, we need to do a lot more and do it more quickly if we're really to achieve the kind of targets that we want on climate action. Thanks, Kiran. Orla, did you want to come in on yeah, that? I suppose it very much ties into particularly the, the sustainability pillar of the new European Bauhaus. Um, so circularity in terms of, as we mentioned, the construction ecosystem has got to radically change. Um, things like fast fashion, our textile industries have got to uh, change. Um, even in terms of a more than human approach to thinking about a different relationship with nature so that we, uh, because we're, soil depletion is a huge issue <clears throat> and uh, pollution of our water courses um, from excess uh, fertilizer and, and over intensive agriculture 
practices which relate to what Sean is saying, there's pressure from above to always produce intensive, cheap food. And so that's a systemic um, uh, shift that has to happen uh, towards circularity, which basically means, I mean, circularity sounds like, okay, well, what does that mean? It actually just means we've got one planet. We have to to stop trying to take, take, take from the planet because it can only give us so much if, and, and we're just throwing it away. And we have to guard more carefully the resources that we have for in every system, from food, from construction, um, from uh, nature and ecosystems, biodiversity, and what we, uh, the, the things that we buy and consume every day. So it is local, but it, there's also this bigger systemic um, overview, I think. And I think the new European Bauhaus has the potential to recognize those two, three scales, actually, the scale of the people, person, the scale of communities, and then the scale of the planet. So I would hope that it's a vehicle to try to be holistic in trying to deliver circularity. Great, thank you very much, Orla. And Sean, I might I might put this question to you. Um, uh, somebody has asked on social media, in terms of uh, the pandemic has given new importance to the outdoors and public spaces, but considering the recent events on South William Street and the closure of Portobello Plaza in Dublin city, how can local authorities respond to scenes like those without simply shutting off uh, local uh, public spaces? I think um, the Robert Emmett Centre in um, in town, uh, the community development project is currently doing a mapping of Dublin 8 and the green spaces in Dublin 8. Um, I think we have to grapple with the inequality of access to public space and it comes back to the spatial justice issue that um, I mentioned uh, very briefly in the presentation. When people were confined to their two kilometres, what did they have in those two kilometres in different parts of Dublin? Did they have access to parks? Did they have access to um, areas of recreation could they even go outside comfortably without um, you know being loitering essentially and um, i think what we see in south william street is the culmination of a lot of things um, not least the pandemic but also um, a lot of people drawing into the center of of town because you know there wasn't an intentional effort to provide the facilities that would have distributed people more at an earlier stage and so south william street became something of a hub uh, so i think i think you know i'm not the best in terms of urban planning i've no experience in it but but it as as a lay person it would strike me that there needs to be a greater emphasis given to equality and spatial justice in terms of developments um, one thing I would just go back to on the circular economy piece, just really quickly, if you don't mind, I think we can afford to think radically right now. The world's in grave danger and we need to think absolutely outside of the box to move forward. There's a brilliant anthropologist um, uh, in Sweden by, by the name of Alf Honberg, who wrote a book, The Power of the Machine and Money Magic and other things. But one of the ideas he's proposing is um, a universal basic income paid in a digital currency that could only be used within five kilometers of its payment for things like food sourced within that five kilometer radius and uh, repairs. And so if we really want to start incentivizing repair, incentivizing bringing things into back into use, these are the types of things we should be thinking about pursuing. And, and they're possible now, global leaders in, in equity issues, um, but actually with, with mobile phone use, uh, digital currencies, localized digital currencies could be incredibly successful in breaking exploitation in, in places where our supply chains emerge as well. So that's one piece. And then the second thing just on this, and it's really important because I flew past it, but it's critical. The community-led local development multi-fund approach, Ireland has another three months roughly while we're coming up with our plans for the EU structural funds to opt into that approach or miss it again for another seven years. And that is a, that is missing out on putting resources directly into the hands of communities to enable these things. So um, I'd, I'd really encourage, and, and the Irish Local Development Network have some brilliant expertise on this, but I really encourage people to look into um, uh, how we can encourage uh, Ireland to go that direction. Great, thank you very much, Sean. And I'm just conscious of time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but we've so many questions coming in. So uh, very kindly, we have two of our speakers who can remain on with us, but Kieran, you have a prior engagement. So thank you for your time. Is there any, um, before you have to slip away, is there any concluding remarks you'd like to briefly give? 
No, well, look, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Just on that last question, I think somebody has to be in charge of our public spaces. I think the design of them requires a lot of different players from landscapers to planners to architects to the to the people who are cleaning the street after the rubbish has been has been thrown down. Um, the management of public space is no accident, but it has to be planned for. And certainly from uh, the time I spend in Belgium, I can see how they do it well. They invest in their local authorities and they invest in public spaces for a lot of people living in small spaces who don't have a back uh, a front garden or a back garden. But look, I think the conversation has been really fruitful. I'm sorry I have to leave you. I'm very happy to stay in touch on all of these issues. Good to see you all. Great. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Kieran, and and thank you, Orla Sean. We'll just go to two more questions, and we'll be, we'll be. I'm looking at the clock, so one one o five uh, is our cutoff point. Okay, so our next question comes in from Liz uh, Liz Rich. Uh, she is the. CICAP Goal 2 team leader and a social enterprise specialist. And she is wondering that how do we ensure that movements like the NEB and its values are adopted by all state institutions in Ireland? Enterprise Ireland, for example, are promoting Irish companies uh, engaging with Amazon rather than promoting new movements such as platform cooperatives, pardon me, platform cooperativism which better reflects the values of the NEB and does the panel have any views on this? Uh, I don't know who'd like to take that, Orla or Sean? Um, um, go on. You go ahead, you go, you, No, no, you go first, you go first. Um, I suppose my, just to say I don't know about platform cooperativism, um, it sounds interesting. I, uh, I would certainly like to see the, um, the, the values of the New European Bauhaus adapted broadly. Um, just to touch on, say, for a moment, education, is that uh, as a, a, a teacher of architecture, so in the construction industry, um, we found it incredibly challenging to try to shift out of old traditional models of teaching into to figure out what, you know, how do we design rapidly change to a different type of design that designs this new world. And that's just one small example. But this is this is completely cross-cutting. It, it, it affects every aspect of our lives. Um, and we can either have to respond, going back to my first comment, we can either respond to it through uh, responding to disaster, whether that's the next flood, the change in our coastal communities who might have to undergo managed retreat, um, uh, change to our, our agricultural policies, changes to our cities and towns, or we can choose to design them and that in itself is challenging but it is a more positive approach so i would love to see uh an, an all of government approach uh and it is coming i mean there the um climate action plan um <clears throat> is coming you know it is in, in effect now uh, every county has a decarbonization zone or is in the process of of uh, allocating a decarbonization zone i think I'd like to see more than one in every county. I think people are up for having more than one. There's, there should be no limit on it because this has to happen across the board. It has to happen, as Sean said, locally. Um, and I'm delighted to see in, in Mayo, for example, the decarbonisation zone is going to be, um, it was put out to competition for to local communities to uh, compete for it, which was really good, but it was coming from local communities. And Leader, I think, actually is a really important organization and way of funding that that supports those communities so if we could get more of that happening at a local level i think it'd be really positive at the same time we do need that support from the government and it is going to be coming down the line from europe because all of the money in related to the the new uh, rec recovery from the pandemic and the eu green deal is going to going to be related to a green recovery so um we can choose to have it imposed on us or we can choose to design it and to activate it locally. And certainly I think that would be the more positive way to, to go about it. So I'd be, I'm afraid I don't know about those, those movements in relation to Amazon. Um, I'll throw in data centers there as a huge potential challenge in terms of the amount of energy that they're going to require. Um, and how do we design uh, a response to that? There's massive challenges there. And um, certainly they're gonna need every uh, expert uh, work uh, from everybody we can who, whose intelligence and collective intelligence we can harness um, in terms of, of addressing this m kind of massive challenge that we face. Great, thank you, Orla. Sean, did you want to come in on that? Um, 
I think there's a major challenge at the minute in terms of the amount of initiatives. Uh, this is a brilliant initiative, and and um, but it exists in this uh, universe of of the obviously the Green Deal. You've got the the Climate Pact, which is the bottom up component of the Green Deal, and um, you've got you know the Sustainable Development Goals and all that comes with that. So we need to somehow um, plug these initiatives together so that they're communicating with each other you know because what i'd like about what i like about what i'm seeing with with the european bias is this idea that it has to be participative it has to be inclusive and it's about bringing that into all those other facets and um, to make sure that you know you're not doing the same thing over here as you're doing and um, it's somewhere else in europe but with, with it under a different name Great. Thank you very much. Well, listen, on that point, and I'm so very sorry, but I'm afraid the clock is completely against us, ladies and gentlemen. So apologies if we... Uh, we would love to uh, to have you keep engaging with this conversation, so please do uh, keep in touch. Um, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for uh, this morning in terms of our webinar on the new European Bauhaus. A big thank you to all our speakers, to Kieran Cuff, um, to, to Orla Murphy and to Sean McCabe. Thank you for being a fantastic panel today on what is a really exciting project. I'm sure our audience learned a lot. I certainly did, and I look forward to hearing a lot more to, about about the new European Bauhaus as, as it progresses. Um, I would like to thank our colleagues and our good friends at the European Commission representation in Ireland for all their help with today's event and also to my own team in European Movement Ireland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in, for your questions, your comments, your engagement on social media. It was fantastic. Um, another event tomorrow, as if it's not busy enough, but um, and I think this one is also very timely. We want to know about the EU digital COVID certificate and Ireland and how that is all going to pan out and take place. So to find out more, join us tomorrow at 12 noon, an event with the European Parliament Liaison Office and the European Commission representation in Ireland. And you can register your attendance by emailing events at europeanmovement.ie. So until we all meet again, please do take care, stay safe. Thank you.